Welcome to The Vine Podcast. I'm Jason, producer and regular contributor to The Vine Podcast, and I want to provide a brief introduction to this week's episode. First, we recently changed our podcast feed, so if you're listening to this episode now, congratulations, you have the new feed. But if you speak to others who have not been able to hear new episodes since around late August or so, they may need to resubscribe in their podcast app or go to thevinetemple.com and look for the link to the podcast at the bottom of the page to resubscribe. Second, I need to let you know that the episode you're about to listen to was recorded without the aid of a proper microphone. So while I believe the majority of the episode can be heard okay, Uh, The audio quality really is not very good, and it may be frustrating for some listeners. My advice is to listen in a quiet place, preferably with headphones, and most people should be able to hear okay. Uh, This probably isn't the best episode to try to listen to while in the car. Uh, For next week, I have a plan to get better audio quality, so uh, hopefully this is only a one-week problem, and I appreciate your patience and understanding. Now to the episode. So this is the second in our series titled Affirming, which is the Sunday morning Bible class that the adults and high school students at the Vine are engaging in. Uh, This class session was recorded live on Sunday, September 18th, 2022, and posted a couple of days later. Thomas Nichols uh, teaches this class, and uh, in it he describes how his journey as a young, faithful Christian with deep struggles about his sexuality led him to scour the scriptures for answers, answers that eventually brought him to a place of peace and joy as a child of God. Thomas is an extremely well-read and biblically knowledgeable person. He knows so much about what is actually written in the Bible, and he wisely is able to discern the difference between what is in the Bible uh, versus the traditions and lessons that we've learned that may not necessarily be reflected in the Bible, at least not in the ways that we typically believe. Thomas has been part of the Vine family for almost three years now, well before the Vine decided to be a fully affirming church, and he currently serves on the leadership team of the church. We appreciate his wisdom, perspective, and joy, and I'm sure you will be blessed by his lesson. So here is Thomas leading the class on Sunday morning, part two in our Affirming class series. Enjoy. All right, so um, let's, um, let's pray. Dear God, we are here in your presence asking you to bless us and to fill us with your Holy Spirit. <coughs> Be ears that hear, eyes that see, and minds that comprehend. All of us may not be ready to hear what I'm going to say, and I pray, Lord God, that you use me as your instrument of righteousness, and that nothing is of me, but everything is of you, because you are Almighty God, and you are the most important. Um, Thank you for blessing us. Thank you for this day. Thank you for this opportunity in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so uh, as, uh, as Warren put up there last week, I told him, and this is our basic topic, how we became an affirming church. And this is my portion, a journey. And I, I titled the session, Reinterpreting the Clobber Passages. Uh, okay. So this is me. I am Thomas Nichols. You can find my notes at this bit.ly. If you're not familiar with bit.ly, all you have to do is type in bit.ly slash and then whatever name or letters they give you. And if you purchase Bitly, you can choose your own, but I didn't purchase it this time. So uh, it's going to be 3, Aura, Big L, Little L, Y, Y, and number one. That's my East Texas accent, Aura. <laughs> so if you want to see the notes online, actually you've got notes. Oh, see, I'm such an overkill person. And don't <laughs> feel like you have to... Uh, Fill out the notes, you can put them back in a way and just tune in and listen. Basically, I'm an oral learner myself, so if I hear something, it sticks. If I see something, uh, it'll stick too, but I, I prefer to just listen and to comprehend that way. I'm an oral learner. But some people are visual learners, that's the slideshow. Some people are kinesthetic learners, that's the, the sheets out there, so you can do something uh, as you're uh, 
as you're uh, here listening and participating. Three aura, big L, little L, Y, Y. Okay. All right. So the overarching question, <laughs> catch that, the global question, as a teacher thing, <laughs> is what is the relationship between the Bible and LGBTQIA+. And this topic is dear to my heart because when I became a Christian at 11, 12-ish, um, I didn't really start growing until I got baptized, oddly enough, uh, in, a, in a Baptist church. I became a Christian Assembly of God and I was baptized Southern Baptist. And that's when I began my DQT, Daily Quiet Time, where you... Uh, Pray and read and sing and have your time alone with the Lord every day. So, the Bible is very important to me. Reading is very important to me. Books are very important to me. Things written down. Anybody see the movie Yentl? Love that movie. But that it's about, it is written, and that, that is important. So, when I struggled with my attractions, uh, to guys as opposed to girls. I mean, I love women and I love girls, but I just wasn't there with them other than one of them as friends. Uh, becoming a Christian was very important, what the Bible said. And I undertook to read the Bible through on my own with a KJV, because back then that was the only Bible that was really available. I mean, there were revised standard versions, but I didn't know that. Most churches in the east, deep East Texas used King, King James Version. And let me tell you, I did pretty good. Genesis, Exodus, Numbers did me in. <laughs> and then um, years later I tried again, and this time I had an NIV, an international version, so it made it a lot easier. And plus I was following a plan. Read so many in the New Testament, so many chapters in the Old Testament, and a psalm for every day. And so uh, it worked out that I was able to read the Bible through. So this study is my journey, and I just want you to know that to me the Bible is important, and that's why I wanted to um, uh, research this topic. Uh, all right. So does anybody have Revelation four five pulled up yet? I want at least two people to read, one person to start us off, and the second person, if yours is different from what that person read, then maybe your version, we'd like to hear that one as well. So would someone read what their version of the scriptures say for Revelations, Revelation 4, verses 5? Go ahead, David. And from the throne proceeded flashes of lightning, and sounds and peals of thunder. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And that's Revelation 4, verse 5. Mm -hmm. Direct. I must have uh, done it wrong then. Uh, Revelation 5, verse 4. And I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. Thank you so much. Read that again and stress the last phrase. And I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. Does anybody have something different where there are different words? Bridget. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Exactly. Book, scroll, which does it matter? So in this instance, it's not germane to being saved, right? It's not some, if, if it were book, if it were scroll, it wouldn't really matter. The actual Greek word is scroll. And there was a Greek word for book. And it was not used by John. So I wanted to point that out, that there are things that are said in the Bible interpretations where the person has a reason for choosing the word he chose and it isn't always going to matter, but sometimes it does. 
matter what word that person interpreter chose. Let me change this in my notes. If I do this again, 5-4, thank you. Thank you, David, for doing that. And thank you, Jesus, for giving me the idea that maybe I transposed the numbers. <laughs> All right, so here's another one. Um, Uh, Matthew 3 1. Let's hope it's the correct one. So, someone get there. Go ahead, Jason. In those days, John the Baptist came into the wilderness of Judea proclaiming. John the Baptist, John the Dipper. I like John the Dipper. <laughs> John the All Out Bather. Um, the submerser. Um, there was a quandary that King James, uh, the first, I guess it was the first official translation into English of the Greek and Hebrew writings. Um, they, came, they came to this word and they were like, oh, we cannot translate this word. The word is baptizo. And you'll see that on the handout. Uh, baptizo literally means to dip. It was the, word, the verb that uh, people who dyed cloths would use to describe what they did for a living. I dip cloths and dye them. They have to be tough. You don't want... Oh, no, this one's a tie-dye. <laughs> so maybe you do want... <laughs> this one's a tie-dye, so... But still, you tie it in knots and you dip the whole thing. You pull it out, you retie it, you dip the whole thing. You don't just dip this part, dip that part. Um, otherwise, it's not, I don't think it would look good, but maybe it would to you. So. But regardless, the word baptizo means to fully immerse, to dip. In fact, um, in the New Testament, there's a passage that says that the uh, Hebrew children, when they went through the desert on their way out of Egypt, they were baptized by the, the presence of God. They were under the cloud, the presence of God. Um, so why were they having a problem interpreting the word as what it is? Why did they decide to transliterate the word, which is basically take the Greek letters and change them to the the English letter sounds and just make up a new word. Do y'all know? What was going on in the Catholic Church at that time? How were people baptized? That's right. And if they, if they actually interpreted the word the way I think it should have been interpreted, or literally, then they would have a problem with the Anglican Church and the Catholic Church. The, and the reason I wonder well, why do they why do they get to the point where they're pouring or sprinkling and not dipping and immersing? And um, I read a long time ago that people would delay. I don't know about you, but when I was remember I said I was saved when I was eleven or twelve. I wasn't baptized until I was seventeen or eighteen. Why? Because I was scared. I really felt like something was going to happen that I was not going to be prepared or ready for. And so I really wanted to make sure that I understood what this, the whole thing was about before I actually took, took it on. Well, so people would delay their baptisms in the old days because they didn't want to get baptized and then sin, and then would they need to be rebaptized again? How does all that work? And Am I still forgiven? Whatever. So they would wait to their deathbed. Well, you can't really take a person who's dying and take them out to the lake and go, okay, <laughs> in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you're going to be gone. Raise them up to life. They'd be raised up dead. So uh, they began instead pouring, and, and then they began sprinkling. And that became the way to do baptisms at the time that the King James Version was introduced. Did you know that, Bridget? I did not. So maybe somebody told me a lie and, and told me that story, but I, I read it somewhere. It's written. And, uh, on, on that first, um, so in this app, I can look up a bunch of different stuff. And so I like to go to the complete Jewish Bible and see what the Hebrew says. And they called him Yachan the Immerser. 
Thank you for pointing that out. <laughs> I love languages. In fact, I was gonna I was gonna actually start off by saying, "Como estás?" or "Como están?" And the first word is "como," and it means "how are you?" Right? And then I could say, um, "Como se llama?" or "Como se llaman?" How do you or what do you call yourself? Well, we would say, "What's your name?" And then I would say, Eres tu como el agua en mi fuente. And in that situation, como means not how, not what, um, but like. You are like water in my fountain. I love that song. Anyway. All right, so, so it's John the Immerser, John the Dipper. Does it matter? How we translate it? Well, we just came up, when they said we're not going to translate it, we're going to transliterate it and take the words, uh, the letters from Greek and make them English, the way they sound. Uh, so, that has to be done in the Bible. Okay. First page for me. Now, next one. Second Timothy 3.16. And let's hear from some who aren't members but are actually visitors. Actually, maybe you are a visitor, aren't you? So thank you for starting us off there. Uh, this is 2 Timothy, the epistle that Paul wrote to Timothy, chapter 3, verse 16. I'm pretty sure. What does it say, starting in 15? Y'all going to let David do this again? All right, fine. Start 15. Start 15, yes. And that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which you were able to give you and the wisdom that leads you to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. So that the, all right, go ahead with 17. Read 17 too. Mm-hmm. Um, that the man of God may be adequately or adequate, quick for every good work. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. So that the person of God may be complete, fully equipped for every good work. I would prefer to read it that way, but that's just me. All right, so mine says all scripture, and his said all writings. So what were the writings or scriptures that Paul was referring to that says these are inspired, God breathed, literally? These are inspired uh, words from God. What scriptures was or writings was this in reference to? Yeah, at that time, the New Testament wasn't even formed. Paul was still writing his letters, his epistles. The Gospels were still being written, and there's a Gospel of Mary, and there's a Gospel of Thomas that aren't included in our Bible. Why? So a group got together later, uh, uh, senior pastors and, uh, or something, and they decided, okay, these, we... we uh, feel pretty confident, we can attribute their authorship, and these are uh, sent to us or given to us by God. And they made the decision. And now the Jewish people had done the same thing with the old, what we know as the Old Testament. They actually are separated into three or four different uh, categories. Uh, uh, the prophets, uh, the history, uh, and they have certain names in them which just now are escaping me. But, um, so Paul, when he wrote this to Timothy, all scripture is God breathed was referring back to the Talmud and the Jewish scriptures. But what do you think? Can the same be said for the New Testament? Which are writings that became to us scripture? Personally, I think it it leaves room for that. But that's just my personal opinion. You could make the argument that Paul is referring only to the Old Testament and therefore we should all be an Old Testament church. But you don't hear that, do you? We are a New Testament church because the New Testament, the New Covenant is grace. And that's found in the Old Testament. Every time you see the word loving kindness, shara or whatever it is in Hebrew, that is interpreted as grace or can be interpreted as grace. So it's there, but it but 
Well, all that to say, I believe that you can, that you should include up to Revelation and maybe even beyond. Uh, that I don't know. But uh, anyway, just a, something to consider. Now, knowing all of that, neither fornicators nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals shall inherit the kingdom of God. May your Holy Spirit speak, Lord God. Speak the truth, Father God. Coming from a family that tells me that what I am separates me from the love of God has sent me on a 20-year spiral of self-doubt and loneliness. The Bible says that they're worthy of death. I went into this research wanting the answer no matter what it revealed. If God said, you are such a horrible abomination that I needed to rid this planet of myself, I was willing to do that because I love God that much. But when I dug in, that's not what I found. This is a 1946 Revised Standard Version. So this is the first time in all of history, in any language, that the word homosexual ended up in any Bible. They combine two words that have nothing to do with each other into homosexual. There were 22 people in the translation team for the RSV, and there were 90 boxes of archive notes found at Yale University. We didn't know what we were going to find when we dug into the RSV notes. Third day, we found what we were looking for. It was a letter written by a 21-year-old seminary student to the translation team saying, hey, I think you chose the wrong word when you put the word homosexual in here, um, and I don't understand why you did that. He says, I write this after many months of serious thought and hard work to point out that which to me is a serious weakness in translation. Misinformed and misguided people may use the RSV translation of 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10 as a sacred weapon. He wrote the letter as David S. We found him and he's still alive? So I wrote a letter and to my amazement I got a reply back about three weeks later. I received your letter and uh, there may be something to, to what you say. The domino had already fallen and that word followed through to all the other mainline translations that we have today. By the 90s, homosexual is in six different passages where it just doesn't belong. I started weeping because I was thinking about all the damage that had been done over the last 60 years. The lifestyle of some male homosexuals has triggered an epidemic. The Bible condemns homosexuality as a sin. Why did they put the word homosexual into the Bible? What were they thinking? The church is doubling down on this issue because they've so politicized it. We're going to do the work to make this thing right. This shows that there was a mistake, and it's an honest mistake, and we have an opportunity to change it. So think about that, Tisa. Think about the word we're going to go over today and how what their literal meanings are and how they were actually interpreted. Uh, by the way, there is a rebuttal argument that I included on your notes. If you want to read the opposite of where, where they say it doesn't even really matter what they did then, what matters is now. Uh, yes. So are they saying the word homosexual was not even there? And Correct. They added it? Correct. There is a Greek word that they chose to translate as homosexual. What was the Greek? We're going to get into that. Okay. Perfect. All right. So before we do, this is my journey. Um, lest I forget something, I'm going to read it. And if I start crying, I have somebody else start reading it. <laughs> ah. The Holy Spirit is here with you. Okay, maybe I should have somebody else read this. Each of us has our own path to take, yet we may arrive at the same place along the way. My journey on this issue began when I realized that I was attracted to men rather than women. I love women and enjoy being around women more so than guys my own age or older. 
But I had no desire to be with any of the females except for friendship, and although I avoided guys because they seemed so foreign and so different from me, I found myself being drawn to a few of them. I tried my best to dispossess myself of such notions and dispel such inclinations. As I matured, in fact, when I was 15, I half-heartedly attempted suicide twice. The second time, the first time it was with scissors. They were the only things available that were sharp in my room. And uh, they weren't sharp enough. My mom knocks on the door. I'm going to town. You want to go? I put a rug up back in and wore wristwatches and I put my wrist to cover the sore that I had made. And said, sure. The next time it was um, with the uh, razors. I thought, okay, they're sharp. But I couldn't find one of the safety razors. I could only find the stuff that goes into the disposable. <laughs> and so I was trying to get to work, and this, the phone rings, and stupidly, uh, I answer it, and the girl says, a friend of mine says, so what are you doing? <laughs> I don't know, what am I doing, what do you want to do? So anyway, as I matured into an adulthood, no matter what I tried, I could not suppress my emotions and passions, but I didn't like I was going insane. Literally, no, but I felt like I was going insane, trying to be straight, trying to be the be the guy that likes girls. I tried Bible study, prayer, exorcism, yes, you heard that right, counseling, seminars, books, and audio tapes on the subject, and even driving from Temple to Dallas every Thursday night as a teacher for nine months during the school year in order to attend the next gay ministry. I even considered suicide, especially after a friend of mine ended his life, unable to reconcile his Christianity with his sexuality. His name is Jim Adams. Then one day, during my daily quiet time, the scripture and prayer of my reading included the passage from 2 Samuel 12. So turn in your Bibles or turn to 2 Samuel 12. Turn to 2 Samuel 12. There's a way to get rid of that. I'll leave it alone. Now that's a lot to read, so let me read this one. This is where Nathan the prophet confronts David the king. And I was reading, clueless as to what I feel like God showed me. Which, by the way, I want to say, first off, I am not trying to convince you of anything. I'm simply describing my journey. I appreciate what Warren said. We may scatter the seed, but it grows how it grows. Uh, there was one time I was teaching a Bible class at another church in town, and one of the guys was just not getting the concept of Jesus is the one and only son, but we're, aren't we God's sons too, and God's daughters and children? And he just couldn't grasp that concept of what the actual word means, unique, not necessarily literally the one son. So, um, and he just got so frustrated. I said, well, the Holy Spirit will reveal it to you when you're ready. Well, I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe you feel that way. Um, but I'll, I'm presenting this for you to consider and to ponder, not to say this is the way, but to say this is something to consider, which is why I included the rebuttal. Then, but there's a part of that chapter where Nathan, basically, David has sinned with Bathsheba. She's pregnant. He's killed Uriah. Uh, Nathan is sent by God to the king to tell him a story and then to confront him. And he confronts him. He says, you are the man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. What? Did you catch that? God says he gave them wives into his arms. I gave you all Israel and Judah, and if all of this had been too little, I would have given you even more wives. It doesn't say wives, but I'm like, what, what was that again? God says, I gave you his wives, and if you wanted another wife, I would have given you another one. All you have to do is ask. I'm not here promoting polygamy or polyamory. Uh, but uh, as a young man in 
his 20s reading that, I was like, wait a minute. So I decided to do some research. Now, I had been given a Bible by my grandmother, a King James Version. But when I got older, I was given a Thompson Chain reference. Do you remember that? They're awesome. So, off to the side, there's all these categories that are expounded upon in the back of the Bible. And it says polygamy. And this is the, um, which, which verse is this? This is... 1 Timothy 3, verse 2. So if you turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2, it says, An overseer then must be above reproach, the husband of but one wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach. So I went to polygamy, the, the category, and here it says Titus 1, verse 6, so that obviously deals with polygamy as well. And in the back of the Bible, there's all these other verses that deal with polygamy. There aren't that many, actually. And in not one, not one, not one of the verses that it was saying polygamy is a sin. God condemns polygamy. And evidently, Nathan, just a report from God in 2 Samuel, God doesn't condemn polygamy. He actually says, here, you want another one? I'll give you another one. I'm not condemning it. I'm just saying, this is, it's just like, so the Bible does not teach that polygamy is a sin. This is, and if, if, the, if, the, if Christians are wrong on this huge topic, <coughs> we're in, by the way, there are polygamists in the world, uh, especially in other countries, but there are some here in this country, and polyamorous as well. Then if, if, the, if the church is wrong about preaching this as sin, can they be wrong about other things as well? I would go deeper into what does it mean the husband of one wife, but I'll let y'all figure that out for yourselves. Um, Rashida, I think I put down all the possibilities that that could possibly mean. So I undertook a personal study of all the clobber passages, and because I, when I was going to Baylor, my pastor that I went to church at Spiegelville Baptist Church, he did a lesson, he did classes on the Greek. So we learned the alphabet, we learned the tenses, we learned the conjugations, we learned how to interpret for ourselves the scriptures. Um, all right, so I kept reading in my daily quiet time, and I came across Isaiah 56. This was a long one to read. Does someone want to read it? It's really quite interesting. Sure. Pay attention to this. Cut off. Restore. Go for it. Uh, Starting in verse 3. And we'll go to verse 4, and then I think that'll be it. Neither let the foreigner that hath joined himself to Jehovah speak, saying, Jehovah will surely separate, from, separate me from his people. Neither let the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus saith Jehovah of the eunuchs, that keep my Sabbaths, and choose the things that please me, and hold fast my covenant. Unto them will I give in my house, and within my walls a memorial, and a name better than of sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name, that shall not be cut off. I think it's really interesting that he uses the word cut off, the word for cut off there, because that's exactly what is a eunuch is. Uh, someone who's had something cut off. And yet, that, and that has prevented the eunuch from worshiping with the other Jewish people because he was damaged goods, basically, and was not allowed to come into the uh, places of the temple where everybody else could go. You know, everybody could go thus far. Men and women could go thus far. Men only could go thus far. Priests only could go so far, and the holy priests could only go into a certain area one day out of the year. Um, so, what is a eunuch? And, and I actually presented this to a, 
a friend of mine, a Sunday school teacher, uh, and um, Ryan at uh, University Baptist Church in Austin, where I was going for a while. And he was not convinced that eunuch had anything to do with, with people who were gay. But I was like, well, to me, it speaks to me that it is rela it's relatable. All right. So then I kept reading my daily quiet time would come along. So I'm pondering what I read from Nathan the prophet in 2 Samuel. I'm pondering what I read from Isaiah about the eunuch, who is, God says, I will restore you and I will give you children, spiritual children, far more than you could ever have physically. And then I came to Matthew 19. So there, the disciples and Jesus are having this discussion about um, marriage and wives and how the, the, the cultural phenomenon or expectation that if your brother died then you had to marry or you wouldn't really marry he would make pregnant his widow so that his line could continue. But what if that brother died, and the next brother died, and the next brother died? And who's that woman married to when we get to heaven? You see how women were good about the property sometimes? Um, so his disciples in verse 10 say what? If this is the case between a man and his wife, it is better not to marry. Not, and Jesus says what? Not everyone can accept this word. But only those to whom it has been given. For there are eunuchs who are born that way. Others were made eunuchs by men. And still others make themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. The one who can accept this should accept it. Now that is the same word in all three instances. But is that the way it's translated in your Bible? They use different words, maybe. They don't use the word unique, except maybe one time. Am I right about that? Mine has it three times. Does yours? Yeah. Well, hum de dum de. <laughs> Mine doesn't. It's the new international version. I read it as if it were there, but it, it doesn't. Um, all right, so what does born eunuch mean? So there's a note in the Amplified Bible that says, making them incapable of consummating marriage. I don't know if it's accurate. So... Um, Translation from Greek actually has an idiom from the womb of the mother. Right. So I think born. I'm guessing that's how it's literally tra or literally translated, but in the right. translation from birth. So right. From birth. Eunuch from the womb of the mother or eunuch from birth. Born eunuch. So at at that time I, in my life journey, I was actually well aware that there were people who were born with indeterminate genitalia. Sometimes both were there. Sometimes it was hard to determine what was there. So in most instances, they um, made um, the child male. They would sew one thing up and let the other thing grow. In some instances, they would cut off one thing to uh, make it match. In some places, they just left it alone to the age of three when they, when they could figure out which one the child's going to be, male or female, and sometimes even later. I actually have known people who are intersex, which is the term now. But that's the I, LGBTQIA, by the way, intersexed. People who are born that way. Um, so my thinking was could this be someone who was born LGBTQIA or is it just a physical thing those who are born 
who, those who are made eunuch by men, those who are, dam- are damaged or castrated by others, and uh, those who make themselves eunuch for the kingdom of heaven's sake. Those who remain celibate. And 1 Corinthians 7, verse 7, talks about the gift of celibacy. So then that also got me to thinking, wait a minute, it says make themselves celibate. So how can you go that route without being gifted that way with God, knowing that as long the Christian teaching is very correct, I believe, that you should not have sex before marriage, um, to, to remain without sex your entire life would be quite a chore. Uh, for someone who hasn't got the gift from God to maintain that. To me, that's, that's, how, I, that's how I think. So I don't have that gift. And uh, I was being made by others to embrace that as, well, this is just how it is for you. You're accepted, you're welcome, but you cannot act on it. So... I began reconciling all the scriptures used as weapons against me and dug deeper into their meanings and interpretations. So now, very quickly, we're going to go through the other things and probably not finish, which is why we have this and bust my notes if you would like to uh, see the rest of it. Did the Greeks have a word for homosexual? No. But they did have two words that describe the person who was the active partner and the person who was the passive partner. Erastus means um, the desirer, the one who desires. And eromanos means the receiver, the one who is desired. So it's the desirer and the desired. Are either of these words found in the Bible? No. They were there. Paul could have used them. Now this word is not, there's no written evidence that this word ever existed, but there is a Roman word that's very similar, and so they also think that this word was being used at the time, pathikos, and it was basically referring to the one who submits to the advances of another. Kanidas, Kanidos was the pejorative, the put down. Oh, you're just a Kanidas, you're just a sissy, basically. Was that word used? No. None of these words that Paul could have used to describe actual people in relationships, same-sex relationships, but he did not. He chose to use malakoi, a Greek word that means soft. It's used in the Bible and elsewhere to sh- uh, as the person who goes in, into um, the courts of a king or something wearing fine clothing. Well, the word there is malakoi. Fine, soft clothing. So if it were applied to a person, a person soft of character, someone who can't make up their mind, someone with no integrity, someone with low morals, someone who's just, you know, I'm a woman, I think that's just how it is. And the other word is arsenokoitai never existed before Paul. This word is in no uh, written literature at the time or before and only appeared much, much later after Paul's writings as a Greek word. So it's a word he coined or made up, taking two Greek words, arseno, male, koitai, from which we get cortis or intercourse, males have intercourse. Have you not known that the unrighteous shall not inherit the reign of God? Neither pornoi, malakoi, nor arsenokoitai. From 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9. Pornoi is the uh, word for prostitute. And this one's for male prostitutes, or just like in other languages, uh, muchachos can mean boys, but it can also mean boys and girls. Ninos can mean boys, but it can mean boys and girls. Niñas can only mean girls. Muchachas can only mean girls. Alright, so um, there's your two words and there's Malakoi which means basically soft. And Matthew chapter 11 verse 8 used it to describe clothing. In the ancient world, now there is of the possibility that this was used as a pejorative 
to men who are soft, who are sissy. It could not be connotation of sexual. Uh, it, could, it could have that concept of, of homosexuality, but in its usual sense, it's not that way at all. And the one for Arsene McCoy time is definitely uh, Paul making reference to Leviticus 18 22, where it says, Do not have sexual relations with a man, that's with man that's detestable. The more we'll go back there. But if you look at that Leviticus 18 22 chap, uh, verse, look at the context. What does 21 say? What does 23 say? Very interesting, if you think about it. Verse 21 says, Don't sacrifice your children to Molech. Verse 23 says, Don't have sex with animals. And in between those two, it says, Men should not have with men as they do with women. Is that then talking about relationship? Or is that talking about a fertility ritual? My understanding is that in the old, 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 old days, to make the crops grow and the sun come and sunshine and the rain come, they, they would um, act out creating, well, they would have sex with the temple priestesses. And if there weren't enough women to go around, they would have sex with, with the men. Well, Thomas, at that point in time, there were both male and female prostitutes that were in the church that were part of their ritual right. worship. And the concept of this is when you look at the context in the back, he was condemning men who were married to women, heterosexuals, that would go in and have relations with the male prostitutes versus the female prostitutes. Right. And that's why they were referring to it as unnatural. Right. Well, okay, we'll get to that word. So, in Pornoy, of course, I, I told you means prostitute, and 1 Timothy 1, 9 through 10, actually comes up with a vice list. It's a, it's a, a vice list is a, is a way of presenting your information in a neat way. So, way. so if you read through verses 9 through 10, it says, We also know that the law is made not for the righteous, but for lawbreakers and rebels, for the ungodly and sinful, the unholy and irreligious, for those who care for fathers or mothers for murderers. That's four groupings so far. For the sexually immoral, the fifth grouping, for those practicing homosexuality, for slave traders and liars and perjurers, liars, that's the sixth group, and liars and perjurers, and for whatever else is contrary to the sound doctrine. So there's six, possibly five, depending on how you group them, groupings that relate to each other. Uh, those who kill their fathers related to murderers. I found that my knowledge of those, the script, the uh, Greek, that these three kind of went together. Pornoi, Arsenikoitai, and Andro Apodistis. These are slave traders. Those who go out and procure people to sell. What do we call them in today's world? Sex traffickers. Sex traffickers, or pimps. These are the clients, Arsenikoitai. And these are the prostitutes, literally, pornos, pornoi. To me, that's what that group represents. Again, is it speaking about relationship? People in the same-sex relationship? I don't think so. Now we get to Romans. When I told my mom on Mother's Day that I was gay, yes, it happened. But to my <laughs> credit, it wasn't unintentional. She just kept asking me questions. And I don't lie, so I could answer them. I told her that I was going to a church that um, practiced liturgy. And she knew very well I did despise liturgy. No <laughs> uh, but my dad and I had argued many times about certain things because they were Presbyterian. And so um, I eventually told her that it was MCC Waco. And she said, well, why are you going there? A church that welcomes homosexuals. And anyway, so the next weekend, she brought my dad. She hadn't told him anything. And, but that Tom said something to say about something earlier. So my dad and I had this conversation, and he looked at me and he said, 
I know you are very strong about your release with the Bible. So, what does the Bible have to say about all of this? And I was like, well, except for two places, Leviticus 18 and Romans 1, I explained away the others. This one gives me pause as well as Leviticus. So what does naturally mean? Even, and by the way, if this is um, about lesbianism, it's the only verse in the entire Bible about lesbianism, if it is about lesbianism. Now what does that say? All right. Even their women exchanged natural use, and the Greek word is physike, or physike, physical, physike, krasin, which means use, uh, physical use or natural use for, and I put the word paranormal in there because it basically almost transliterates paraphysis, paraphysic, para as someone who stands alongside or someone who um, is above or beyond or just think about, just mull over what does para mean. Even though women exchange natural use for paranormal, in the same way the men let go the usual banner, the natural use, physicane, chrysane, chrysane, of the female. So what is natural? We operate under philosophies that have been around for ages. The Stoics were the first ones, during Paul's time actually, and maybe with fire too, who came up with the concept or idea that they put out there that there are global natures. But this isn't how, how Paul was using it. It's not natural. It's against your nature. He was using it in a different way. How does he use it in Galatians 2? Verse 15. I don't have that one written down. I don't think. Oh, yeah, here it is. We ourselves are Jews, physic, and non Gentile Gentile sinners. We are Jews by nature. What does that mean? By birth. By birth. And that's how some of them interpret that. We were born Jews. We, um, after circumcision, there are just certain things we do as Jewish people. We are Jews by nature. We are Jews, and you, you would recognize us as Jews because these things we do usually are typically not Gentile sinners. sinners. What does Romans 2, verse 27 say? Gentiles by nature. Physios. Okay, mine says, and an uncircumcision by nature, fulfilling the law, will judge you through letter and circumcision are a transgressor of, transgressor of law. In the first instance, Paul speaks of Judeans by nature, or perhaps those born as Jews. In the second instance, he refers to the Gentiles as those who are physically the uncircumcised, as that is part of their nature, what is expected of them. They don't get circumcised. They have sex with men have sex with them. And they think nothing of it. They think it's a natural, perfectly fine way to do things. And then, God against his own nature. Look at Romans 11 24. God is acting unnaturally. What can that possibly mean? Contrary to whose nature? How can God contradict himself? Or is this merely saying that God can do the unexpected, what is not typically considered the proper thing to do? Which Romans 11 4 says, After all, if you were cut out of an olive tree that is wild by nature, and contrary to nature, para physine, para, para physine, contrary to nature, or para nature, were grafted into a cultivated olive tree, how much more readily will 
with these, the natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree. Typically, the cultivated branch is grafted into the stronger wild branch. You don't cultivate a wild branch and transplant it or put it into a cultivated plant because the cultivated plant is weaker. You want, is this making any kind of sense? Rose bushes are that way. Uh, there was something in, in the United States that killed all the rose bushes. It's so natural rose bushes are used to house the grafting of cultivated roses because the natural root is much stronger than the cultivated root would be. So, just so I understand what I think you're getting at, it sounds like what you're suggesting is that by nature, we're not talking about a universal truth, a nature that is applicable to every right. person within the species, but nature as a personalized nature. And my nature may be different than your nature. Exactly. And so it's natural for me, but just as you can't graft a wild branch onto a cultivated branch, that nature may be different for you or for someone else. Yes, that's exactly what happened. Um, a short story. My, my spouse I was with for 22 years. His dad was a Baptist preacher, and after his mother's death, um, my, my spouse's mother's death, he came out to his dad, and his dad said, I need it all on. And by the way, don't let anybody tell you from this verse that this is unnatural against nature. What's natural for you is what this verse is talking about, not what's natural for everybody else. So they had a great relationship after that. Um, anyway, so in using paraphysin, oh, let me put this way. Just as God acts in unusual ways, grafting a wild branch into a cultivated branch, then in the Romans 1 passage, the men and the women are behaving it's atypically in ways they don't usually act. In using paraphysin, Paul is not making a moral judgment, nor is he moralizing by using optimia, translated. Shameful. Paul uses the same word to apply to himself in 2 Corinthians 11 21. To my shame, and the Greek word is the same word, atimia, used in the Romans passage. To my shame, I admit that we are too weak for that. Whatever everyone else desires to boast about, I'm speaking as a fool, I also hear the boast about. Paul addressed Jew and Gentile discord by using a non-controversial topic. This means nothing. This whole thing that we're basing our, that many Christians and the church is basing this attack on gay and lesbian and transgender and so on people is all based on Paul, on a passage of Paul's name. We can all agree that those Gentiles do some strange things. He's not saying they're sinning. He's saying that if they have their way of doing things, you have to do it. Um, a non-controversial topic. He didn't use the topic of food. He didn't use the topic of circumcision. He used this topic. Notice the gay acts were not given moral nor ethical status. Paul does not use the Greek word for wickedness to describe these same sex acts. Instead, he uses the same Greek word to describe chamber pots. <laughs> now, in a large house, there are notably there, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of clay. Some are for honor, and some for shame. This, but they're necessary. So. Paul isn't attacking or condemning. He's simply pointing out something everybody agrees with. The Jews say, yeah, those Gentiles. And the Gentiles say, yeah, why are y'all so stuck up? So Romans 1, verse 18, Paul does use the word wickedness, which does imply and mean sin, something that's unacceptable in any situation. He used it in 18. He used it in 29. 
Every Jew knew that Gentiles engaged in what Jewish people thought of as inappropriate behavior. Every Gentile understood the casual approach to same-sex activities they took was from the by the Gentile Jews. The practice was expected of Greco-Romans by both cultures. No controversy there. Not like whether or not to get circumcised. Ouch. They were having a huge disagreement about that. Or to eat meat sacrificed to idols. Again, another huge disagreement. And these are the words in Greek that uh, as, as, as and Didikion. This, Adikion. This is the one that is used in other places as well. Talk about wickedness or sin. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godless Asabion and wickedness at Achaon, of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness at Achaon. So this the passage we're looking at starts with wickedness and sin. And it ends with wickedness and sin. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness at Achaon, evil, greed, depravity. Envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, gossip, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Sound familiar? Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death. What's missing from that list? Sexuality. Exactly. It was a non sequitur It's a non-starter. This topic of home level of that the church today has made such a huge thing. It was no big deal. In conclusion, let us leave to the Creator to deal with those who are the Creator. Romans 14, 14. Let God be judged. I am convinced, being fully persuaded in the Lord Jesus, that nothing is unclean in and of itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, then for that person it is unclean. Now Paul could have said that no food is unclean, because in the context he's talking about food sacrificed to idols, and um, that Jewish people uh, are condemning other the Gentiles for eating those foods. And you know the story about Peter having that tent come down and kill, God says, kill and eat, and they were all unclean animals. So he could have said, in that context, no food is unclean. But he's just talked 14 chapters back about homogenitality, which is why the writer that I have, get some of my stuff from. Uses. And he says, no thing, nothing in and of itself is unclean. Just ponder that for a little bit. Because later on in verse 20, he does say, all food is clean. So maybe he was just implying. Again, come to your own conclusions. But Daniel Hemanian. Daniel uh, was the author of a book called What the Bible Really Says About Homosexuality. And this is a phrase, uh, a passage I'm going to end with. Paul could not open his letters to Romans with talk about clean and unclean foods. The debate over foods was still splitting the Christian communities. Likewise, circumcision was too sensitive an issue. But evidently, homogenitality was not. It was an obvious point of difference, and apparently there was no intense argument over it. I've covered all the other passages, except for the Sodom and Gomorrah story in the, in the Old Testament. Not that much to say about it, and yet it's such a big deal. Paul's mention of homogenitality could let Jewish Christians feel superior without in anyone's eyes accusing the Gentile Christians of real sin. Okay, that's my presentation. And this is a book I was referencing. It was a life changer for me. I read lots of books after this one. And there are many more out there that are being done here as we speak. Alright. Um, Lord God, thank you for
for being with us today and help us to understand what you want us to understand. Place in our hearts the knowledge that we need to hear and help us be 